All right, let's talk about confidence intervals. So the definition of a confidence interval is if we use the same sampling method to select different samples and we computed an interval estimate for each of these samples, we would expect the true population parameter, in this case beta 1, to fall within the interval estimates 95% of the time. So I'm going to say that again because I think the interpretation of confidence intervals is something that we often get wrong when we're talking about statistics. So if we used the same sampling method, in this case uh, the way that we're sampling these sparrows, to select different samples and we computed an interval estimate for each sample, so we got a 95% confidence interval for each of these samples, we would expect the true population parameter to fall within the interval estimates 95% of the time. And so the way we actually calculate this uh, for a given beta coefficient is it's going to be the beta hat value, so in this case beta hat 1, plus or minus some critical t value times the standard error of beta hat 1. And so that t star is going to be the critical value for a t distribution uh, with n minus p minus 1 uh, degrees of freedom. So we're going to use that that t distribution density curve to obtain the desired confidence level. And often we want a 95% confidence level and so that's what we're going to show here. And so coming back to this uh, example from R, we've got our wing length here, our estimate is 0.467 for beta 1 and our standard error is 0 0.0347. And so T star here, our critical value for a T distribution with 114 degrees of freedom, and that's because there are 116 observations in this data set, and we have one parameter here, wing length, we have one uh, predictor rather, wing length, two parameters, the intercept and uh, beta one, and so we subtract those from the 116 to get 114. And so that critical value is gonna be 1.98. And so if I take this 0 0.467 and I subtract 1.98 times the standard error, I get 0.399, and that's exactly what I get here for my lower bound of the confidence interval. And for the upper bound, if I add 1.98 times 0 0.0347, I end up getting 0 0.5636, and that's exactly what I get for my upper bound. So again, Confidence interval, if we use the same sampling method to select different samples and computed an interval estimate for each sample, we'd expect the true population parameter to fall within the interval estimates 95% of the time. All right, so there we have it. We have answered our first three parts of linear regression questions. Is there a relationship between the response variable and the predictors? How strong is that relationship and what is the uncertainty? And so the final question is how accurately can we predict a future outcome? And so this is where uh, we might use kind of different, different techniques. And so using the information here, how could I predict a new sparrow's weight if I knew the wing length was 30? So I could take this intercept, 1.37, and I could add the slope, 0.467, multiplied by that, that uh, new wing length value of 30, and I would predict 15.38. And so what is the residual sum of squares again? Note, in previous classes, this may have been referred to as the SSE, the sum of squares error, but in this book, we talk about residual sum of squares, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about here. So the residual sum of squares is yi, our observed outcome, minus yi hat, and so that's our predicted outcome, squared, and then sum these all up across all of the observations in our data set. And there's something called the total sum of squares, and this represents the variability of the outcome, and it's equivalent to the variability described by the model plus the remaining residual sum of squares. And so this is going to be if we summed up yi minus y bar, and so this would be uh, each of those outcomes, yi minus the average outcome for y. So this is basically taking all of the y's and averaging them, and then squaring this, and that's going to be the total sum of squares. And why does this matter? Well, there are many ways to assess model fit, but two common ones are the residual standard error and R squared, the fraction of the variance explained. And you saw R squared recently in your lab, this, this popped up. So the residual standard error is going to be 
uh, the residual sum of squares divided by n minus p minus 1. And r squared is going to be 1 minus that residual sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. What could, be, what could we use to determine whether at least one predictor is useful? So again, this will harken back to a previous statistics class probably, but we can use what's known as an F statistic. And this uses similar components uh, as what we had previously shown, but this will use the total sum of squares minus the residual sum of squares divided by P, the number of predictors, that's the numerator, and the denominator is going to be the residual sum of squares divided by n minus p minus 1. And this is going to be f distributed uh, p, uh, p degrees of freedom, and n minus p minus 1. So there's two parameters for an f distribution, p and n minus p minus 1. It corresponds to the numerator degrees of freedom and the denominator degrees of freedom. And so both all of these quantities that we've talked about so far, this, res, this uh, residual standard error, the R squared, and this F statistic, these can all be seen using the glance function. And so notice here I'm saving this whole fit. I'm saving everything here as a value LM underscore fit. And I'm doing that because in order to use the glance function, I actually have to pull out one component from this. And so I want to pull out the fit component from the lm underscore fit object. And that lm underscore fit object is just this linear regression fit that I've done with my tidy model framework. So the glance function gives us a whole bunch of values to help us determine the accuracy of our model. One of them is the r squared. Another is the adjusted r squared. Sigma corresponds to that RSE that we talked about. And the statistic corresponds to that f statistic, along with a p-value for the f statistic. And so what this statistic tells us again is that at least one of our variables in the model is important. And so that's what this p-value corresponds to. So you'll notice some of the output here in this glance function is similar to what you see when you use the collect metrics function. And in particular, this r squared value is, is similar. It's the same. Uh, so the glance is, is nice if you want to see these other kind of model-based statistics. Uh, but you can get r squared from just that collect metrics function. Okay, so what I want you to do is using the model you previously fit, using that MT cars data, I want you to predict miles per gallon from weight, and I want you to pull out the F statistic and r squared using the glance function and interpret these values.
All right, so go ahead and knit that and then submit it.